we are very pleased to present you with an inspiring locally made story about the development of an advance in brain machine interface technology, the Stentrode, the world's first endovascular neural interface. The non-invasive procedure to implant the device significantly reduces the risk of infection, making it safer than any other brain machine interfaces have been so far. The story is typical of that of great science and technology stories, which include a bold vision to do something new and a collaboration across different disciplines and institutions, locally and internationally. It is a great example of the convergence increasingly taking place in the biomedical sciences that this network proudly promotes to the community. And yet again, it's another story that adds to Melbourne's reputation as a global centre in bionics. As someone studying an interdisciplinary degree, I'm particularly excited for this evening's presentation as I think the intersection of engineering and biomedical sciences is fascinating. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the collaboration behind the technology. Dr. Nicholas Opie is the Chief Technology Officer at, of Synchron, a US-based startup which incorporates the Australian company SmartStent. He completed his undergraduate science degree at Monash University in 2007 and received his PhD from Melbourne University in 2002 for research into the development of the bionic eye. Dr. Opie and his colleague Dr. Thomas Oxley received a 1.1 million US dollar grant from the US Defence Department's research agency, DARPA, for the development of the Stentrode device. This led to a further $7 million in grants from Australian funding bodies. Synchron recently announced that it has raised 10 million US dollars in a series of funding rounds that would enable it to carry out its clinical trials for the Stentrode device. This February, Dr. Oxley was announced as a recipient of the Westpac Bicentennial Foundation Research Fellowship of $330,000 over three years to support his research. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Opie as he comes to the lectern to deliver his address, The Stentrode Story. Fantastic. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for, uh, for coming on this beautiful Melbourne afternoon to, to listen to my presentation. Um, we are talking about endovascular brain machine interfaces. Uh, I don't expect you all to know what that is yet, but hopefully by the end of this, uh, this 40 odd minutes you'll have a, a bit of an understanding on what this tech is and, and some of the other things in the field that are helping people with, with paralysis and other conditions to, to return to a, a, what's called normal sort of life. So. I'm pretty sure that everyone here will know who this is. If you saw this guy down the street, you'd be able to identify it as Superman. I mean, is there anyone here who doesn't know who this is? No? What about this guy? If you saw him down the street, man with quadriplegia, would you know who that was? This is also Superman. This is a guy that had an accident, fell off his horse, broke his neck, and now he's quadriplegic. He can't use his arms, he can't use his legs, he can't eat by himself. He can't dress himself and he probably can't go to the toilet by himself. And this is, this is still Superman, but this is what happens after, after an accident. There's no way to cure this and there's no prevention. And it's not only his story. This is the story of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Like 1.2 million in the US and the equivalent sort of number is based on population here. There's a huge number of cases every year of mainly males having accidents, risk-taking behaviour, you know, driving a car too fast perhaps, jumping into a, into a shallow pool or, or just being unlucky. This happens to hundreds of thousands of people, often really young, and they spend their entire lives having to have someone else care for them, having to have someone else look after them. And there's no cure, and we need to do something about this. If you compile that with paralysis in general and take a broader scope, six. A million Americans, 60,000 Australians, and McKinsey Global did a study recently that in advanced economies alone, over the next decade, this number will grow to around about 50 million people. This is huge. So many people uh, are paralysed because of spinal cord injury or, or stroke or, or even uh, loss of limb. And one of the reasons DARPA got involved to start with was because people are coming back from, from war injured. It's great, they're coming back alive. This didn't used to happen. There's advances in medical response and advances in, in armor that are protecting them. Uh, but these guys are coming back. You know, they're, they're fighting for us, they're coming back, uh, and they're coming back injured. And they're coming back missing arms, they're coming back missing legs. And, and, and these guys and girls, they deserve us to, to try and help them out. This is some of the tech that's come out. This is, this is an exoskeleton, uh, and this is pretty amazing. This is a lady who had a spinal cord injury by doing a, uh, a forward flip uh, on the ski slopes. Um, as you can see here, that 
the, the gentleman behind her is, is controlling these legs, but for the first time she's able to get up out of this wheelchair and sort of take some steps across the, across the stage. And, and she's using this really well with, you know, as you can see there, 12 hours, very minimal amount of training. And, and this is some amazing tech, but it's not for everybody. If you don't have upper body strength, if you don't have arms, or if you don't have use of your arms, you're not going to be able to use this equipment. And I've been speaking with a couple of exoskeleton guys recently, asking them, what is it that you want? How can we make this better? Uh, and one of the problems they're having with this tech is that the, the step size is limited. It's a push of a button. The, the gentleman in the back is the one that was controlling his legs in this, this example. If you're coming up to a hole in the road, you need to change your step size. You need to make it shorter to avoid it and then longer to get over it. You might need to be able to lift your leg up to get over a, a break in the road or to get up a step. Now these are things that can't be controlled by these technology at the moment. Uh, and that's something that the brain machine interfaces have the ability to do, to, to put gray scales inside the black and white that would be you know, one standard step size. So what is a brain machine interface? Well, it's a way that you use your brain directly to control things. It doesn't really matter what it is. You can control computers if you need a computer. You can control exoskeletons like we just saw. You can control wheelchairs and, and cars and robotic limbs. And there's some amazing kit that's out there at the moment that can be used. The problem is that we can't connect it properly yet. We're having real trouble getting the information out of the brain in a reliable and long-term way to be able to use these devices and pieces of equipment over the long term. I'm not going to go into neuroscience too much, but I want to give you a bit of an understanding of how we can extract brain information and how we use that. On the left here is uh, some, some AEG, some brain signals, some voltage recordings from electrodes placed on, on the skull. Now, what you do with these in pretty much all this brain machine interface technologies, you'll extract this and you'll look at different frequencies, if you will, and, and the strength of these different frequencies is shown on the right. And what you can see is if you're resting, you look at the blue line. And what the blue line is, to a degree, doesn't really matter. But what's important is when you're trying to do something, when you're thinking about performing an action or actually performing the action, these things change and you, you're getting a red line. Uh, and there's a decrease in this low frequency and there's an increase in this high frequency. Now what we do is we get information from all these different electrodes. We, we look at where these frequencies are changing and, and what's, what's happening when people are trying to do things. And we can say, aha, this electrode's changing when they're thinking about moving their arm. Let's use this now to control the arm. We don't have to worry about the other one. So I could give a whole talk on neuroscience, but that's sort of just the very basics on how we can get a signal and, and how we know what we're looking for and how we can use this to, to control things. There are a lot of different electrodes. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief overview on, on some of the current ones that are being used. There's the surface electrodes seen on the left. They're placed on the, on the scalp. They're, they're non-invasive. But the problem is you have to put them on every time and you just don't get the signals you need. The brain will block the high frequency signals that you need to control a, uh, a dexterous prosthetic or robotic limb. So they're going to have their place, sure but it's not going to be to control the technology that, that we're looking at. If you go up a step, you've got epidural electrodes or subdural. What happens with these is you'll get a saw, you'll perform a large craniotomy, remove some of the skull and put these electrodes onto the brain themselves. They work quite well if you, you know, can handle the surgery and if you can handle having these electrodes with wires coming out of your brain for a long period of time, which is not ideal. If you go even further, you can have penetrating electrodes. And this is where you have a, a craniotomy again. You remove some of the skull, you get a pneumatic gun, and you shoot the electrodes into the brain. This is, this is true, but it's working really well for the short time. Over the short period, it's working well. There's issue with tissue trauma and rejection that's stopping these devices from getting FDA approval and from getting to market. So this here is uh, a bit of an indication of what I was saying before. This is one of the subdural er electrodes that was placed on top of the, the surface of the brain. And in these images on the left, I really want to draw your attention to the red and blue bits. And so the, the sinusoid line is when the, the person is doing an open and closed movement, when they're trying to do something and when they're thinking about doing something. And what you can see is com when you compare uh, the different electrodes in these different boxes. 
Some have red spots, some don't. And the red spots correlate with when the person's thinking about doing something. And by using this and by choosing the electrodes, you can get people to control different pieces of equipment. And this is a man with tetraplegia who had this implant in, who's using it to control a, a prosthetic limb to, to reach out and touch someone for the first time in years. This is done with minimal training. So he did a lot of training beforehand, but in this example, he had only spent, I think it was one, two days connected to the limb itself. So even with a very limited amount of work, he could, he could get this, this moving. If you move up in scale, someone who's been using this device a little bit longer, you can see that there's other applications for direct brain control. And this is a lady here who's, who's using a spelling device. She's using her mind to control this computer program, to write a story, write a letter, say goodbye to a loved one, whatever it might be. And I don't know if any of you have seen my dad type, but she's doing a lot better than he is. She's actually going pretty fast. And she can write sentences, and, and, and this, is, this is something that came out earlier this year, and so this is the, the fastest that they've got it so far. And then you can go a step further. And this is a gentleman here who has a, one of the penetrating electrodes in, so one of the bed of needles electrodes, and he's got them implanted. And you can see, the thing I like about this is he's talking to his wife while he's moving this robotic arm and, and the, following the cursor on the screen. This is a sort of more normal behavior. You're gonna be using these devices while you talk to people. You want to be able to have the ability to to have a normal conversation and not have to think so hard about where your arm is or what you're trying to do. And so what I like about this is it shows that it's possible to do this. It's really possible to get your brain information and convert it into signals and commands that can be used to control wheelchairs and prosthetic limbs and, and spellers. This is what's happening now. And it's, it's very exciting. There, there are problems, there are problems. This is a graph that was done by um, Jack Judy. He was one of the program managers at, at DARPA. Um, what he'd found was, if you follow the blue line, this is the surface electrodes that go over the top of the skull. On the bottom, this is how long someone's had the device, and, and, and up the side, it's how much information you can get from these devices. The blue lines are surface electrodes. You put them on every day. They'll work the same all the time, but you're not getting enough signal out of them. The red line is more interesting. This is these invasive electrodes, the ones that are penetrating into your brain or being placed on your brain. These are working really well. People are training, they're getting excellent results, but they're failing. They're all failing, and they've spent millions and millions of dollars trying to overcome this problem of how do you get these devices and electrodes to be more reliable. And I like to think of it like a splinter. If you put a splinter in your finger over time, your body will reject it and push it out. And that's what's happening to some of these electrodes. They're getting covered in tissue and glial scarring. And yes, they're working for a long time, but they're not working as well, and they are failing. And this is one of the reasons, and one of the big problems, of why this technology hasn't got out to people yet. Because it's, it's great, it works, works well for a little bit, but it stops working. So this is the, the five main things I think need to be addressed to make a good brain-machine interface. Obviously you need to have large number of electrodes so you can record from multiple areas. You want to be able to um, play the piano or use multiple fingers at once. You need to have a better surgical procedure that's not invasive, that doesn't require open brain surgery, that doesn't require people to stay in the hospital for extended periods, that doesn't have a risk of infection and bleeding. You need to have a device that doesn't get shot into the brain directly. You know, that's, that's dangerous. You're hurting the brain. You don't want to do that. You want to record from it in a, in a safe and non-invasive way. Uh, and obviously, you want to enable these devices to be able to control multiple different pieces of technology. And I think the bottom one, they've got. You can control technology. They've got the technology, but, but how, do you, how do you combine them? Before I go into what we're doing, this is a clue. Uh, on the left here, you have uh, what's called a venogram. You put contrast dye inside your, your blood vessels and you, you take an x-ray and you light it up. And what you can see is there's, there's some big blood vessels there. On the right, this is the human brain. And again, the, the blue is the blood vessels. But what's interesting is the red, red portion, that's the motor cortex. So that's the part of the brain that is responsible for or is involved in movement. 
And one thing you might notice is that there is, just here, there's a big vessel that goes right near that, uh, that part of the brain that we're trying to access. And that's how we decide to get there. We want to be able to get into the brain without opening the skull, without touching the brain itself. But we still need to be under the skull so we can record this information. And so we've been developing in what we've called an endovascular neural interface, a device that is implanted through blood vessels to get to the brain. So all these surgical complications and issues are being, being mitigated. Uh, we got Pierre from the Royal Melbourne Hospital to give us a little animation of how, how this would go, what it looks like. And one of the benefits of this technology is that because we're not touching the brain directly, we're essentially invisible. We're hiding. We're hiding in a blood vessel. And when we do that, the immune responses, the reactions that occur are different. We're not getting rejected in the same way that uh, these other neural electrodes are. In fact, what's happening to us, as I'll explain further, is we're getting incorporated into the vessel. We're becoming part of the body. And that's not being rejected. And that's, that's very positive. So it's called the, the stentrode. Uh, it's based on technology that's existed for years. You've got cardiac stents that are, that are used to keep blood vessels open. You've got uh, neurological stents that they put up into the brain to remove blood clots. And all we've done, really, is just use it for a different purpose. We're putting sensors and electrodes on these devices so we can deliver them safely. They'll open and expand when inside the motor cortex or inside the blood vessel region of interest. Uh, and when they're there, we just record the information. And you can see it here. This is a, a five millimeter device that's being um, deployed from within a, a one millimeter diameter catheter. Uh, and by using a nitinol, a self-expanding material that's used in, in braces and, uh, and bra underwires and orthopedics and, and so forth, it's a material that has amazing properties that allow it to be compressed and expanded numerous times without fatigue. And by using this, we can make sure that we get our device, as shown on the left, inside the vessel, but not blocking the vessel. It'll expand and put all the electrodes around the outside to keep the vessel open so the blood can flow through as, as its purpose. Difficult to show that this is going to work. So I'm going to take you through the steps that we've gone through so far. Uh, you know, obviously, a lot of this research with the University of Melbourne, Royal Melbourne Hospital, the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, of how we're tackling this problem of, of proving that it works, and then how we're going to show that it works well enough to, to stay in patients and, and be used for long term. This on the left is a, is a sheep brain. Uh, sheep are, are very good at, at a lot of things. I don't think having hands is one of them, unfortunately, but they are good for, for our purpose. They're, the vessels are about the same size as what we need for, for the vessel in the human. You can see down there the superior sagittal sinus. The motor cortex as well is, is aligned with, with this vessel. So we can put devices in over the motor cortex, over a similar region to the brain as, as humans, and, and we can show that we're getting signals. On the right, again, is a, is a venogram. We flush contrast into these animals. We'll, uh, we'll take an x-ray and we can see here clearly where, where the vessels are, and so we know where we need to go. I'm not a clinician, I'm an engineer, I'm not very good at surgery, but what I'm about to show you is one of the surgeries that I did. Uh, it took about half an hour, uh, it was very quick, um, and if I can do it in, in that long, then someone who's a trained professional in a larger vessel with an animal that doesn't uh, try and move all the time can, can probably get much better results. But what I'm showing you here is, this is the, the animal facing to the, uh, to the left. A microwire, microcatheter, delivery catheter, these are just different tubes. This is how we're going to get up to the region we need to. We put uh, one tube in, a big tube, and a smaller tube, and a smaller, and so forth, and you access where you need to go. This is the video of, of accessing this pathway by using little wires and then feeding larger catheters or larger tubes over the top of them. You go around into the, into the skull, around the back of the brain. And when you're there, you, you stop and you go, OK, where do we need to go? Where, where's the hot spot in this animal? You do what's called the contrast run. And you flush contrast. And you find out, OK, well, here's where all the vessels are. 
And from a lot of MRI co-registration that we did previously, we've been able to identify which is the, the sweet spot in, in, these, in these animals. Where do we need to aim for? Once we know where that is, which is around about here, uh, it's a matter of putting the guide wire up a little bit further to where we want to go. You put that four French catheter or the, the one millimeter one that I showed you previously, the green one, up to the region and just push the stent through. It's easy. No drilling, like no shooting things in. Just, just push the wire up, it's plumbing. Very easy to get there. Doesn't take very long. And then the stent's in place. Does it work though? And that's, that's obviously one of the questions. What this graph is essentially trying to say is, is yes, it, it does. We can record neural activity. We're changing the anesthetic level. Uh, we're showing that under these different levels of anesthesia, we're being able to record different neural signals. And this changes immediately after the implant to, to further on. Um, good, doesn't really tell you a whole lot, so you obviously have to go a little bit further. On the left here, we've got what happens over a period of days, uh, and up to 28 days for, for one electrode. We did a SSAP, which is a way to stimulate a nerve and, and measure the response to try and say, yes, we're, we're getting what we're putting in. The brain is, is responding and we're measuring that. Uh, and this obviously image in the middle is one of the sheep brains. The, the yellow dots are the electrodes where they were located in, inside the vessel. And interestingly, what we found is that well, firstly, all the electrodes measured something different. We're not getting electrical shorting because of the blood. All these electrodes are measuring different signals, which means we can put these devices in and record from the hand region and the leg region and the knee region and all these things independently rather than just having one big electrode. How does it compare? Is the next question. I mean, doing all this work, it's still, still some surgery, even though it's minimally invasive. How does it compare? Until we go into humans, and we're hoping to do that in, in 2018, the best we can do is say, can our device, can it record signals that are as good as the epidural and the subdural arrays that have already been shown to work? Like, we, we know those devices can be used by people to control things. We, we've seen the videos. Uh, can ours do the same? We don't have people to do that with yet, but what we have been able to show here is if we put in one of these, these large electrodes, one of the subdurals that requires open brain surgery, and we put in one of our electrodes, are we getting the same stuff out? And, and the answer is yes. We're getting very similar bandwidths or very similar information from the electrodes that, that are being put in by invasive surgery as to those that are being put in by uh, minimally invasive surgery. And this is down here on the, the maximum bandwidth. And the beauty of what we've found with the, this maximum bandwidth is that it doesn't degrade or decrease over time. In fact, over the, over the first little while, it gets a bit better and then it stabilizes. So we've shown that up to and over 20 weeks, 190 days, these devices are getting the same signals as they were when they're two weeks old. We're not seeing this same rejection and degradation that some of these other devices are, are observing. So this here is a, um, an image of one of the brains. We, we took it to the Australian synchrotron. One of the concerns I had as an engineer is if I'm gonna put something inside this vessel, it's gonna block over. That's, that's what I thought. I thought that we'd put this in, it was gonna block over. Now some of the, the clinicians said, even if it does, that's not a problem. Surrogate vesicles are going to come and we're in the drainage system, so the blood is coming out of the brain. Uh, it'll find a way out. It'll, it'll get new vessels. And that seemed reasonable, but I still wanted to assess it. So we, we got a lot of these, these brains. We, uh, we took them to the Australian synchrotron to get some really high uh, definition, high resolution imaging. And you can see up here in, in B and C uh, a couple of things. Firstly, and let me point to it, this here is one of the electrodes. This here is the inside of the vessel, and these little dots here are, are the stent struts. So what, and, and similarly, uh, in a histology, you can see the electrodes and the stent struts. But the vessel remains open in every animal. There were 30 animals. Everyone, the vessel remained open. 
In every one of them, the electrodes had been incorporated into the vessel itself, it had been taken up and allowed for a free flow of blood through the vessel, even though this device was there. We were able to show that um, this happened within, you know, and maintained. It wasn't as if the vessel would get more and more blocked over time. That didn't happen. Once the vessel was covered, once the electrodes and the stents were covered, it stopped. The body said, all right, you know, the vessel's open, don't need to work anymore. Blood still flowed through, our device was there, and this is actually a good thing. We found that when we were putting these devices in, the first week or so, the results were confusing. We weren't getting the good signals that we, we were hoping for. But over a week, after the device had been incorporated and integrated within the vessel, we were getting really good results. We were getting great data because the stent was anchored. We're picking up signals from the same spot every time. They're isolated from each other. And this is a, this is a really nice thing to see. Uh, and this, this shows here, uh, as I've just discussed, the green line is over time we're getting better signals. We're able to record more of this SCP that we were looking for. And similarly, and I, I understand that the implant duration is different, we're certainly looking around you know, the one to two weeks, what happens there more frequently, but it's the same sort of curve. After a little while, it gets better, and once they're incorporated, that's, that's how it stays, and, and this is a good thing. So how's this gonna work in a patient? You know, obviously, the next step is to, to, to implant these, and we're, we're going forward on our global clinical trial in uh, 2018. And how's this going to look? Firstly, we'll get a, a, some patients with, with quadriplegia. We'll, we'll bring them in and we'll do some MRI scanning on them. The reason we'll do this is because we want to know where the hot spots are, where are the best brain regions for these patients, where should we be putting the devices, where's our target? And by getting them to go through a series of, of tests in the, in the fMRI, sort of think about moving your left leg, think about moving your right leg, we'll be able to see where we need to put these electrodes to get the best response. We'll then take them into the angiography room at Royal Melbourne Hospital, small incision in the neck, we'll feed up a wire, but when I say we, it'll be a surgeon, it won't be, it won't be me doing this. Uh, we'll, we'll access the motor cortex and then just deploy the stent. They, they do this routinely, they do this every day. We're then connected to a wireless telemetry unit that's going to be similar to a pacemaker in the, in the chest. We'll ask them, think about moving your legs, think about moving your arms. We'll record this, this information or these changes in, in frequency that we discussed. And we'll use this to control whatever we like. Might be a robotic limb, might be an exoskeleton. We're going to work with the patients and find out, what do you want to control? Some of them said they'd love to control taps in their house. Some of them just want to control the lights. That's easy. What happens down the end of the track, that's fine. It's getting the information out that's going to be difficult. And based on all the, the previous work that's been done by, by groups around the world showing that it is possible to get this information out, then if you compile that with the fact that our electrodes are getting the same signals, it doesn't make too much of a, a leap to say that, yeah, we, we think we're going to be able to get the same signals as well and be able to control these sorts of devices. So I'm very excited. Um, it's, you know, we've done the proof of principle, we've shown that this device can work, we've shown that we can access the part of the brain that is responsible for movement and we can do that without surgery. We've shown that you know, over 190 days we don't get vessel blockage, we don't get rejection like these other electrodes are facing. We're getting signal quality that's just as good as these devices that have already shown that they can work. And we can do this easily. We're now at the stage of preclinical validation. We're speaking with the FDA later tonight, three o'clock in the morning, because they don't want to wake up at Australian time. Uh, so we're discussing with them exactly what procedures we need to do to, to make sure that this device can go to market. What do they want to see for us to, to prove that it's safe? We know it is, what, are they, what do you want to see? When, whatever that is, we'll show that, because we're going to get there, we're going to take this to market, and we know that we can do that because the issues that are facing the other ones, the reasons that these other technologies are having difficulty, they're problems that we don't even have to address. We're not doing open brain surgery. We don't have to worry about that. You know, we're not penetrating things into the brain directly. We don't have to worry about you know, tissue trauma in the same way. Uh, first in human trial, Royal Melbourne Hospital in, in 2018. It's very exciting. It's, it's coming up and I'm uh, you know, hopefully 
when that happens, I'll be invited back and I can give you updates on, on how that works. Maybe get some people doing some, some spellers to start with, you know, typing some messages, uh, moving up to you know, controlling uh, probably a prosthetic limb, or like sitting on the bench, and then maybe connected to them. And we're, we're sort of certainly hoping that, um, th that we can replicate all the, <clears throat> the research that's been done overseas. Obviously, the next step, we're doing a, a very small trial here, a three-patient trial. What you need to do after that is do a much larger trial. You have to get you know, your numbers up. You have to do a global clinical trial. Uh, and once we've done that, you know, it's easy as just getting the FDA to tick the box and we can actually start giving it to people who are going to need it. And that's the, that's the end game. Like, how, do we, how can we make sure that the, the guys and girls who, who are going to use this technology, how is it going to be available to them? And that's... Uh, hopefully in, in early 2020s. So I'm just going to finish up there by saying that we are on track for this, this human trial. It's very exciting. Uh, and you probably didn't need to listen to me for the last 40 minutes because this gentleman who I'm about to, to show you pretty much said everything I'm going to in a much better way and in about 20 seconds. So let me just play this for you. Hi, everyone. This is President Barack Obama. The US and Australia are funding research into a device that could someday allow people to control their prosthetics with their minds and without invasive brain surgery. When implanted into a blood vessel, this network of tiny electrodes can record your brain signals, technology that has the potential to transform the lives of our wounded warriors and others with disabilities. It sounds like something from the future, but it's just another example of how investing in research can move us all forward. I like that shameless little plug, so I thought I'd just put that up there. <laughs> it's obviously a large team that did this work and, uh, and a large number of funding sources that were able to support it, so I'd like to put them up here now and, and acknowledge and, and thank them all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Opie, for taking us through the challenges in developing uh, this remarkable device. I think we should all be very proud of what Dr. Opie and his colleagues have achieved and um, what they have poised to achieve further in the future. Thank you for your attention this evening. It's been a privilege to be your host and to hear about the amazing bionics research in Melbourne that is very likely, we hope, to change the lives of many, many people. Please join with me in thanking Dr. Opie for being with us and sharing the remarkable story. And all of the Convergence Sites Networks events are only made possible through the generosity of partners, which include the refreshments before the event and the video recording to post on the website afterwards. Uh, the network partners and, support and supporters, which I am proud to say includes Women in Science and Engineering, are shown on this slide here. Um, please join with me in thanking the partners for their support, um, which makes this possible. And I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf when I say that we wish Dr. Opie and all his colleagues the best for the future development. Thank you.